Part 10. The Tragedy of Woman's Emancipation from Anarchism and Other Essays. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Anarchism and Other Essays by Emma Goldman. The Tragedy of Woman's Emancipation. I begin with an admission. Regardless of all political and economic theories treating of the fundamental differences between various groups within the human race, regardless of class and race distinctions, regardless of all artificial boundary lines between woman's rights and man's rights, I hold that there is a point where these differentiations may meet and grow into one perfect whole. With this I do not mean to propose a peace treaty. The general social antagonism which has taken hold of our entire public life today, brought about through the force of opposing and contradictory interests, will crumble to pieces when the reorganization of our social life, based upon the principles of economic justice, shall have become a reality. Peace or harmony between the sexes and individuals does not necessarily depend on a superficial equalization of human beings, nor does it call for the elimination of individual traits and peculiarities. The problem that confronts us today, and which the nearest future is to solve, is how to be one's self, and yet in oneness with others, to feel deeply with all human beings, and still retain one's own characteristic qualities. This seems to me to be the basis upon which the mass and the individual, the true democrat and the true individuality, man and woman, can meet without antagonism and opposition. The motto should not be, forgive one another, rather, understand one another. The oft-quoted sentence of Madame du Stille, to understand everything means to forgive everything, has never particularly appealed to me. It has the odor of the confessional. To forgive one's fellow being conveys the idea of pharisaical superiority. To understand one's fellow being suffices. The admission partly represents the fundamental aspect of my views on the emancipation of woman and its effect upon the entire sex. Emancipation should make it possible for woman to be human in the truest sense. Everything within her that craves assertion and activity should reach its fullest expression. All artificial barriers should be broken, and the road towards greater freedom cleared of every trace of centuries of submission and slavery. This was the original aim of the movement for woman's emancipation but the results so far achieved have isolated woman and have robbed her of the fountain springs of that happiness which is so essential to her. Merely external emancipation has made of the modern woman an artificial being who reminds one of the products of French arboriculture with its arabesque trees and shrubs, pyramids, wheels, and wreaths. Anything except the forms which would be reached by the expression of her own inner qualities. Such artificially grown plants of the female sex are to be found in large numbers, especially in the so-called intellectual sphere of our life. Liberty and equality for woman. What hopes and aspirations these words awakened when they were first uttered by some of the noblest and bravest souls of those days. The sun, in all his light and glory, was to rise upon a new world. In this world, woman was to be free to direct her own destiny, an aim certainly worthy of the great enthusiasm, courage, perseverance, and ceaseless effort of the tremendous host of pioneer men and women who staked everything against a world of prejudice and ignorance. My hopes also move towards that goal. But I hold that the emancipation of woman, as interpreted and practically applied today, has failed to reach that great end. Now woman is confronted with the necessity of emancipating herself from emancipation, if she really desires to be free. 
This may sound paradoxical, but it is nevertheless only too true. What has she achieved through her emancipation? Equal suffrage in a few states. Has that purified our political life as many well-meaning advocates predicted? Certainly not. Incidentally, it is really time that persons with plain, sound judgment should cease to talk about corruption in politics in a boarding school tone. Corruption of politics has nothing to do with the morals or the laxity of morals of various political personalities. Its cause is altogether a material one. Politics is the reflex of the business and industrial world, the mottos of which are to take is more blessed than to give, buy cheap and sell dear, one soiled hand washes the other. There is no hope even that woman with her right to vote will ever purify politics. Emancipation has brought woman economic equality with man, that is, she can choose her own profession and trade, but as her past and present physical training has not equipped her with the necessary strength to compete with man, she is often compelled to exhaust all her energy, use up her vitality, and strain every nerve in order to reach the market value. Very few ever succeed, for it is a fact that women teachers, doctors, lawyers, architects, and engineers are neither met with the same confidence as their male colleagues, nor receive equal remuneration. And those that do reach that enticing equality generally do so at the expense of their physical and psychical well-being. As to the great mass of working girls and women, how much independence is gained if the narrowness and lack of freedom of the home is exchanged for the narrowness and lack of freedom of the factory, sweatshop, department store, or office? In addition is the burden which is laid on many women of looking after a home sweet home, cold, dreary, disorderly, uninviting, after a day's hard work. Glorious independent! No wonder that hundreds of girls are willing to accept the first offer of marriage, sick and tired of their independence behind the counter at the sewing or typewriting machine. They are just as ready to marry as girls of the middle class who long to throw off the yoke of parental supremacy. A so-called independence, which leads only to earning the merest subsistence, is not so enticing, not so ideal, that one could expect woman to sacrifice everything for it. Our highly praised independence is, after all, but a slow process of dulling and stifling woman's nature, her love instinct and her mother instinct. Nevertheless, the position of the working girl is far more natural and human than that of her seemingly more fortunate sister in the more cultured professional walks of life, teachers, physicians, lawyers, engineers, etc., who have to make a dignified, proper appearance while the inner life is growing empty and dead. The narrowness of the existing conception of woman's independence and emancipation, the dread of love for a man who is not her social equal, the fear that love will rob her of her freedom and independence, the horror that love or the joy of motherhood will only hinder her in the full exercise of her profession, all these together make of the emancipated modern woman a compulsory vestal, before whom life with its great clarifying sorrows and its deep entrancing joys rolls on without touching or gripping her soul. Emancipation, as understood by the majority of its adherents and exponents, is of too narrow a scope to permit the boundless love and ecstasy contained in the deep emotion of the true woman, sweetheart, mother, in freedom. The tragedy of the self-supporting or economically free woman does not lie in too many but in too few experiences. True, she surpasses her sister of past generations in knowledge of the world and human nature. It is just because of this that she feels deeply the lack of life's essence, which alone can enrich the human soul, and without which the majority of women have become mere professional automatons. 
that such a state of affairs was bound to come was foreseen by those who realized that in the domain of ethics there still remained many decaying ruins of the time of the undisputed superiority of man ruins that are still considered useful and what is more important a goodly number of the emancipated are unable to get along without them every movement that aims at the destruction of existing institutions and the replacement thereof with something more advanced more perfect has followers who in theory stand for the most radical ideas but who nevertheless in their everyday practice are like the average philistine feigning respectability and clamoring for the good opinion of their opponents there are for example socialists and even anarchists who stand for the idea that property is robbery yet who will grow indignant if any one owe them the value of a half dozen pins the same philistine can be found in the movement for woman's emancipation yellow journalists and milk-and-water literateurs have painted pictures of the emancipated woman that make the hair of the good citizen and his dull companion stand up on end every member of the woman's rights movement was pictured as a george sand in her absolute disregard of morality nothing was sacred to her she had no respect for the ideal relation between man and woman in short emancipation stood only for a reckless life of lust and sin regardless of society religion and morality the exponents of woman's rights were highly indignant at such representation and lacking humor they exerted all their energy to prove that they were not at all as bad as they were painted but the very reverse of course as long as woman was the slave of man she could not be good and pure but now that she was free and independent she would prove how good she could be and that her influence would have a purifying effect on all institutions in society true the movement for woman's rights has broken many old fetters but it has also forged new ones the great movement of true emancipation has not met with a great race of women who could look liberty in the face. Their narrow, puritanical vision banished man as a disturber and doubtful character out of their emotional life. Man was not to be tolerated at any price, except, perhaps, as the father of a child, since a child could not very well come to life without a father fortunately the most rigid puritans never will be strong enough to kill the innate craving for motherhood but woman's freedom is closely allied with man's freedom and many of my so-called emancipated sisters seem to overlook the fact that a child born in freedom needs the love and devotion of each human being about him man as well as woman unfortunately it is this narrow conception of human relations that has brought about a great tragedy in the lives of the modern man and woman about fifteen years ago appeared a work from the pen of the brilliant norwegian laura marholm called woman a character study she was one of the first to call attention to the emptiness and narrowness of the existing conception of woman's emancipation and its tragic effect upon the inner life of woman in her work laura marholm speaks of the fate of several gifted women of international fame the genius eleonora duzet the great mathematician and writer sonia kavalevskia the artist and poet nature marie Bashkirtsev who died so young. Through each description of the lives of these women of such extraordinary mentality runs a marked trail of unsatisfied craving for a full, rounded, complete, and beautiful life, and the unrest and loneliness resulting from the lack of it. Through these masterly psychological sketches, one cannot help but see that the higher the mental development of woman, the less possible it is for her to meet a congenial mate who will see in her not only sex, but also the human being, the friend, the comrade and strong individuality, who cannot and ought not lose a single trait of her character.
the average man, with his self-sufficiency, his ridiculously superior airs of patronage toward the female sex, is an impossibility for woman as depicted in the character study by Laura Marholm. Equally impossible for her is the man who can see in her nothing more than her mentality and her genius, and who fails to awaken her woman nature. A rich intellect and a fine soul are usually considered necessary attributes of a deep and beautiful personality. In the case of the modern woman, these attributes serve as a hindrance to the complete assertion of her being. For over a hundred years the old form of marriage, based on the Bible, till death doth part, has been denounced as an institution that stands for the sovereignty of the man over the woman, of her complete submission to his whims and commands, and absolute dependence on his name and support. Time and again it has been conclusively proved that the old matrimonial relation restricted woman to the function of a man's servant and the bearer of his children. And yet we find many emancipated women who prefer marriage with all its deficiencies to the narrowness of an unmarried life, narrow and unendurable because of the chains of moral and social prejudice that cramp and bind her nature. The explanation of such inconsistency on the part of many advanced women is to be found in the fact that they never truly understood the meaning of emancipation. They thought that all that was needed was independence from external tyrannies. The internal tyrants, far more harmful to life and growth, ethical and social conventions, were left to take care of themselves. And they have taken care of themselves. They seem to get along as beautifully in the heads and hearts of the most active exponents of women's emancipation as in the heads and hearts of our grandmothers. These internal tyrants, whether they be in the form of public opinion or what will mother say, or brother, father, aunt, or relative of any sort, what will Mrs. Grundy, Mr. Comstock, the employer, the board of education say? All these busybodies, moral detectives, jailers of the human spirit, what will they say? until woman has learned to defy them all, to stand firmly on her own ground, and to insist upon her own unrestricted freedom, to listen to the voice of her nature, whether it call for life's greatest treasure, love for a man, or her most glorious privilege, the right to give birth to a child. She cannot call herself emancipated. How many emancipated women are brave enough to acknowledge that the voice of love is calling, wildly beating against their breasts, demanding to be heard, to be satisfied? The French writer, John Rebrock, in one of his novels, New Beauty, attempts to picture the ideal, beautiful, emancipated woman. This ideal is embodied in a young girl, a physician. She talks very cleverly and wisely of how to feed infants. She is kind and administers medicines free to poor mothers. She converses with a young man of her acquaintance about the sanitary conditions of the future and how various bacilli and germs shall be exterminated by the use of stone walls and floors and by the doing away with rugs and hangings. She is, of course, very plainly and practically dressed mostly in black. The young man, who at their first meeting was overawed by the wisdom of his emancipated friend, gradually learns to understand her and recognizes one fine day that he loves her. They are young, and she is kind and beautiful, and though always in rigid attire, her appearance is softened by a spotlessly clean white collar and cuffs. One would expect that he would tell her of his love but he is not one to commit romantic absurdities. Poetry and the enthusiasm of love cover their blushing faces before the pure beauty of the lady. He silences the voice of his nature and remains correct. She, too, is always exact, always rational, always well-behaved. I fear if they had formed a union the young man would have risked freezing to death. 
I must confess that I can see nothing beautiful in this new beauty, who is as cold as the stone walls and floors she dreams of. Rather would I have the love songs of romantic ages, rather Don Juan and Madame Venus, rather an elopement by ladder and rope on a moonlight night, followed by the father's curse, mother's moans, and the moral comments of neighbors, than correctness and propriety measured by yardsticks. If love does not know how to give and take without restrictions, it is not love, but a transaction that never fails to lay stress on a plus and a minus. The greatest shortcoming of the emancipation of the present day lies in its artificial stiffness and its narrow respectabilities, which produce an emptiness in woman's soul that will not let her drink from the fountain of life. I once remarked that there seemed to be a deeper relationship between the old-fashioned mother and hostess, ever on the alert for the happiness of her little ones and the comfort of those she loved, and the truly new woman, than between the latter and her average emancipated sister. The disciples of emancipation, pure and simple, declared me a heathen fit only for the stake. Their blind zeal did not let them see that my comparison between the old and the new was merely to prove that a goodly number of our grandmothers had more blood in their veins, far more humor and wit, and certainly a greater amount of naturalness, kind-heartedness, and simplicity than the majority of our emancipated professional women who fill the colleges, halls of learning, and various offices. This does not mean a wish to return to the past nor does it condemn woman to her old sphere, the kitchen and the nursery. Salvation lies in an energetic march onward towards a brighter and clearer future. We are in need of unhampered growth out of old traditions and habits. The movement for woman's emancipation has so far made but the first step in that direction. It is to be hoped that it will gather strength to make another. The right to vote or equal civil rights may be good demands, but true emancipation begins neither at the polls nor in court. It begins in woman's soul. History tells us that every oppressed class gained true liberation from its masters through its own efforts. It is necessary that woman learn that lesson that she realized that her freedom will reach as far as her power to achieve her freedom reaches. It is therefore far more important for her to begin with her inner regeneration, to cut loose from the weight of prejudices, traditions, and customs. The demand for equal rights in every vocation of life is just and fair. But, after all, the most vital right is the right to love and be loved. Indeed, if partial emancipation is to become a complete and true emancipation of woman, it will have to do away with the ridiculous notion that to be loved, to be sweetheart and mother, is synonymous with being slave or subordinate. It will have to do away with the absurd notion of the dualism of the sexes, or that man and woman represent two antagonistic worlds. Pettiness separates. Breadth unites. Let us be broad and big. Let us not overlook vital things because of the bulk of trifles confronting us. A true conception of the relation of the sexes will not admit of conqueror and conquered. It knows of but one great thing to give of one's self boundlessly, in order to find one's self richer, deeper, better. That alone can fill the emptiness and transform the tragedy of woman's emancipation into joy, limitless joy. End of part 10《Marriage and Love》from Anarchism and Other Essays. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, 
please visit LibriVox.org. Anarchism and Other Essays by Emma Goldman Marriage and Love The popular notion about marriage and love is that they are synonymous, that they spring from the same motives and cover the same human needs. Like most popular notions, this also rests not on actual facts, but on superstition. Marriage and love have nothing in common. They are as far apart as the poles are, in fact, antagonistic to each other. No doubt some marriages have been the result of love. Not, however, because love could assert itself only in marriage. Much rather is it because few people can completely outgrow a convention. There are today large numbers of men and women to whom marriage is not but a farce, but who submit to it for the sake of public opinion. At any rate, while it is true that some marriages are based on love, and while it is equally true that in some cases love continues in married life, I maintain that it does so regardless of marriage, and not because of it. On the other hand, it is utterly false that love results from marriage. On rare occasions one does hear of a miraculous case of a married couple falling in love after marriage, but on close examination it will be found that it is a mere adjustment to the inevitable. Certainly the growing use to each other is far away from the spontaneity, the intensity and beauty of love, without which the intimacy of marriage must prove degrading to both the woman and the man. Marriage is primarily an economic arrangement, an insurance pact. It differs from the ordinary life insurance agreement only in that it is more binding, more exacting. Its returns are insignificantly small compared with the investments. In taking out an insurance policy, one pays for it in dollars and cents, always at liberty to discontinue payments. If, however, woman's premium is her husband, she pays for it with her name, her privacy, her self-respect, her very life until death doth part. Moreover, the marriage insurance condemns her to lifelong dependency, to parasitism, to complete uselessness, individual as well as social. Man, too, pays his toll, but as his sphere is wider, marriage does not limit him as much as woman. He feels his chains more in an economic sense. Thus Dante's motto over Inferno applies with equal force to marriage. Ye who enter here, leave all hope behind. That marriage is a failure, none but the very stupid will deny. One has but to glance over the statistics of divorce to realize how bitter a failure marriage really is. Nor will the stereotyped Philistine argument that the laxity of divorce laws and the growing looseness of woman account for the fact that First, every twelfth marriage ends in divorce. Second, that since 1870 divorces have increased from 28 to 73 for every 100,000 population. Third, that adultery since 1867 as ground for divorce has increased 270.8%. Fourth, that desertion increased 369.8%. Added to these startling figures is a vast amount of material, dramatic and literary, further elucidating this subject. Robert Herrick in Together, Paniro in Mid-Channel, Eugene Walter in Paid in Full, and scores of other writers are discussing the barrenness, the monotony, the sordidness, the inadequacy of marriage as a factor for harmony and understanding. The thoughtful social student will not content himself with a popular superficial excuse for this phenomenon. He will have to dig deeper into the very life of the sexes to know why marriage proves so disastrous. Edward Carpenter says that behind every marriage stands the lifelong environment of the two sexes, an environment so different from each other that man and woman must remain strangers separated by an insurmountable wall of superstition, custom, and habit, marriage has not the potentiality of developing knowledge of and respect for each other, without which every union is doomed to failure. Henrik Ibsen, the hater of all social shams, was probably the first to realize this great truth. 
Nora leaves her husband, not as the stupid critic would have it, because she is tired of her responsibilities or feels in need of woman's rights, but because she has come to know that for eight years she had lived with a stranger and borne him children. Can there be anything more humiliating, more degrading, than a lifelong proximity between two strangers? No need for the woman to know anything of the man save his income. As to the knowledge of the woman, what is there to know except that she has a pleasing appearance? We have not yet outgrown the theologic myth that woman has no soul, that she is a mere appendix to man, made out of his rib just for the convenience of the gentleman who was so strong that he was afraid of his own shadow. Perchance the poor quality of the material whence woman comes is responsible for her inferiority. At any rate, woman has no soul. What is there to know about her? Besides, the less soul a woman has, the greater her asset as a wife, the more readily will she absorb herself in her husband. It is this slavish acquiescence to man's superiority that has kept the marriage institution seemingly intact for so long a period. Now that woman is coming into her own, now that she is actually growing aware of herself as being outside of the master's grace, the sacred institution of marriage is gradually being undermined, and no amount of sentimental lamentation can stay it. From infancy almost, the average girl is told that marriage is her ultimate goal. Therefore, her training and education must be directed towards that end. Like the mute beast fattened for slaughter she is prepared for that. Yet, strange to say, she is allowed to know much less about her function as wife and mother than the ordinary artisan of his trade. It is indecent and filthy for a respectable girl to know anything of the marital relation. Oh, for the inconsistency of respectability that needs the marriage vow to turn something which is filthy into the purest and most sacred arrangement that none dare question or criticize. Yet that is exactly the attitude of the average upholder of marriage. The prospective wife and mother is kept in complete ignorance of her only asset in the competitive field, sex. Thus, she enters into lifelong relations with a man only to find herself shocked, repelled, outraged beyond measure by the most natural and healthy instinct, sex. It is safe to say that a large percentage of the unhappiness, misery, distress, and physical suffering of matrimony is due to the criminal ignorance in sex matters that is being extolled as a great virtue. Nor is it at all an exaggeration when I say that more than one home has been broken up because of this deplorable fact. If, however, woman is big and free enough to learn the mystery of sex without the sanction of state or church, she will stand condemned as utterly unfit to become the wife of a good man, his goodness consisting of an empty brain and plenty of money. Can there be anything more outrageous than the idea that a healthy, grown woman, full of life and passion, must deny nature's demand, must subdue her most intense craving, undermine her health and break her spirit, must stunt her vision, abstain from the depth and glory of sex experience, until a good man comes along to take her unto himself as a wife? That is precisely what marriage means. How can such an arrangement end except in failure? This is one, though not the least important, factor of marriage which differentiates it from love. Ours is a practical age. The time when Romeo and Juliet risked the wrath of their fathers for love, when Gretchen exposed herself to the gossip of her neighbors for love, is no more... If, on rare occasions, young people allow themselves the luxury of romance, they are taken in care by the elders, drilled and pounded until they become sensible. The moral lesson instilled in the girl is not whether the man has aroused her love, but rather is it how much. 
the important and only god of practical American life. Can the man make a living? Can he support a wife? That is the only thing that justifies marriage. Gradually this saturates every thought of the girl. Her dreams are not of moonlight and kisses, of laughter and tears. She dreams of shopping tours and bargain counters. This soul poverty and sordidness are the elements inherent in the marriage institution. The state and church approve of no other ideal simply because it is the one that necessitates the state and church control of men and women. Doubtless there are people who continue to consider love above dollars and cents. Particularly this is true of that class whom economic necessity has forced to become self-supporting. The tremendous change in woman's position, wrought by that mighty factor, is indeed phenomenal when we reflect that it is but a short time since she has entered the industrial arena. Six million women wage workers. Six million women who have equal right with men. To be exploited, to be robbed, to go on strike, ay, to starve even. Anything more, my lord? Yes six million wage workers in every walk of life from the highest brain work to the mines and railroad tracks yes even detectives and policemen surely the emancipation is complete yet with all that but a very small number of the vast army of women wage workers look upon work as a permanent issue in the same light as does man no matter how decrepit the latter, he has been taught to be independent, self-supporting. Oh, I know that no one is really independent in our economic treadmill. Still, the poorest specimen of a man hates to be a parasite, to be known as such at any rate. The woman considers her position as worker transitory, to be thrown aside for the first bidder. That is why it is infinitely harder to organize women than men. Why should I join a union? I am going to get married, to have a home. Has she not been taught from infancy to look upon that as her ultimate calling? She learns soon enough that the home, though not so large a prison as the factory, has more solid doors and bars. It has a keeper so faithful that naught can escape him. The most tragic part, however, is that the home no longer frees her from wage slavery. It only increases her task. According to the latest statistics submitted before a committee on labor and wages and congestion of population, 10% of the wage workers in New York City alone are married. Yet they must continue to work at the most poorly paid labor in the world. Add to this horrible aspect the drudgery of housework and what remains of the protection and glory of the home. As a matter of fact, even the middle-class girl in marriage cannot speak of her home, since it is the man who creates her sphere. It is not important whether the husband is a brute or a darling. What I wish to prove is that marriage guarantees woman a home only by the grace of her husband. There she moves about in his home, year after year, until her aspect of life and human affairs becomes as flat, narrow, and drab as her surroundings. Small wonder if she becomes a nag, petty, quarrelsome, gossipy, unbearable, thus driving the man from the house. She could not go if she wanted to. There is no place to go. Besides, a short period of married life of complete surrender of all faculties absolutely incapacitates the average woman for the outside world. She becomes reckless in appearance, clumsy in her movements, dependent in her decisions, cowardly in her judgment, a weight and a bore which most men grow to hate and despise. Wonderfully inspiring atmosphere for the bearing of life, is it not? But the child, how is it to be protected if not for marriage? After all, is not that the most important consideration? The sham, the hypocrisy of it. Marriage protecting the child, yet thousands of children destitute and homeless. Marriage protecting the child, 
yet orphan asylums and reformatories overcrowded, the Society for the Prevention of Cruelty to Children keeping busy in rescuing the little victims from loving parents to place them under more loving care, the Jerry Society. Oh, the mockery of it! Marriage may have the power to bring the horse to water, but has it ever made him drink? The law will place the father under arrest and put him in convict's clothes, but has that ever stilled the hunger of the child? If the parent has no work or if he hides his identity, what does marriage do then? It invokes the law to bring the man to justice, to put him safely behind closed doors. His labor, however, goes not to the child, but to the state. The child receives but a blighted memory of his father's stripes. As to the protection of the woman, therein lies the curse of marriage. Not that it really protects her, but the very idea is so revolting, such an outrage and insult on life, so degrading to human dignity as to forever condemn this parasitic institution. It is like that other paternal arrangement, capitalism. It robs man of his birthright, stunts his growth, poisons his body, keeps him in ignorance, in poverty and dependence, and then institutes charities that thrive on the last vestige of man's self-respect. The institution of marriage makes a parasite of woman, an absolute dependent. It incapacitates her for life's struggle, annihilates her social consciousness, paralyzes her imagination, and then imposes its gracious protection, which is, in reality, a snare, a travesty on human character. If motherhood is the highest fulfillment of woman's nature, what other protection does it need save love and freedom? Marriage but defiles, outrages, and corrupts her fulfillment. Does it not say to the woman, only when you follow me shall you bring forth life? Does it not condemn her to the block? Does it not degrade and shame her if she refuses to buy her right to motherhood by selling herself? Does not marriage only sanction motherhood, even though conceived in hatred, in compulsion? Yet if motherhood be of free choice, of love, of ecstasy, of defiant passion, does it not place a crown of thorns upon an innocent head and carve in letters of blood the hideous epithet, bastard? Were marriage to contain all the virtues claimed for it, its crimes against motherhood would exclude it forever from the realm of love. Love, the strongest and deepest element in all life, the harbinger of hope, of joy, of ecstasy, Love, the defier of all laws, of all conventions. Love, the freest, the most powerful molder of human destiny. How can such an all-compelling force be synonymous with that poor little state and church begotten weed, marriage? Free love? As if love is anything but free. Man has bought brains, but all the millions in the world have failed to buy love. Man has subdued bodies, but all the power on earth has been unable to subdue love. Man has conquered whole nations, but all his armies could not conquer love. Man has chained and fettered the spirit, but he has been utterly helpless before love. High on a throne, with all the splendor and pomp his gold can command, man is yet poor and desolate if love passes him by. And if it stays, the poorest hovel is radiant with warmth, with life and color. Thus love has the magic power to make a beggar of a king. Yes, love is free. It can dwell in no other atmosphere. In freedom it gives itself unreservedly, abundantly, completely. All the laws on the statutes, all the courts in the universe, cannot tear it from the soil once love has taken root. If, however, the soil is sterile, how can marriage make it bear fruit? 
It is like the last desperate struggle of fleeting life against death. Love needs no protection. It is its own protection. So long as love begets life, no child is deserted or hungry or famished for the want of affection. I know this to be true. I know women who became mothers in freedom by the men they loved. Few children in wedlock enjoy the care, the protection, the devotion free motherhood is capable of bestowing. The defenders of authority dread the advent of a free motherhood, lest it will rob them of their prey. Who would fight wars? Who would create wealth? Who would make the policeman the jailer if woman were to refuse the indiscriminate breeding of children? The race, the race, shouts the king, the president, the capitalist, the priest. The race must be preserved, though woman be degraded to a mere machine. And the marriage institution is our only safety valve against the pernicious sex awakening of woman. But in vain these frantic efforts to maintain a state of bondage. In vain, too, the edicts of the church, the mad attacks of rulers, in vain even the arm of the law. Woman no longer wants to be a party to the production of a race of sickly, feeble, decrepit, wretched human beings who have neither the strength nor moral courage to throw off the yoke of poverty and slavery. Instead, she desires fewer and better children, begotten and reared in love and through free choice, not by compulsion as marriage imposes. Our pseudo-moralists have yet to learn the deep sense of responsibility toward the child that love and freedom has awakened in the breast of woman. Rather would she forego forever the glory of motherhood than bring forth life in an atmosphere that breathes only destruction and death. And if she does become a mother, it is to give to the child the deepest and best her being can yield. To grow with the child is her motto. She knows that in that manner alone can she help build true manhood and womanhood. Ibsen must have had a vision of a free mother when, with a master stroke, he portrayed Mrs. Alving. She was the ideal mother because she had outgrown marriage in all its horrors, because she had broken her chains and set her spirit free to soar until it returned to personality, regenerated and strong. Alas, it was too late to rescue her life's joy, her Oswald, but not too late to realize that love and freedom is the only condition of a beautiful life. Those who, like Mrs. Alving, have paid with blood and tears for their spiritual awakening, repudiate marriage as an imposition, a shallow, empty mockery. They know whether love lasts but one brief span of time or for eternity, it is the only creative, inspiring, elevating basis for a new race, a new world. In our present pygmy state, love is indeed a stranger to most people. Misunderstood and shunned, it rarely takes root, or if it does, it soon withers and dies. Its delicate fiber cannot endure the stress and strain of the daily grind. Its soul is too complex to adjust itself to the slimy woof of our social fabric. It weeps and moans and suffers with those who have need of it, yet lack the capacity to rise to love's summit. Some day, some day men and women will rise. They will reach the mountain peak. They will meet, big and strong and free, ready to receive, to partake, and to bask in the golden rays of love. What fancy, what imagination! What poetic genius can foresee even approximately the potentialities of such a force in the life of men and women? If the world is ever to give birth to true companionship and oneness, not marriage, but love will be the parent. End of Part 11
This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Peter Yearsley. Section 1 of Chapter 12 of Anarchism and Other Essays by Emma Goldman. The Modern Drama a powerful disseminator of radical thought so long as discontent and unrest make themselves but dumbly felt within a limited social class the powers of reaction may often succeed in suppressing such manifestations but when the dumb unrest grows into conscious expression and becomes almost universal it necessarily affects all phases of human thought and action and seeks its individual and social expression in the gradual transvaluation of existing values an adequate appreciation of the tremendous spread of the modern conscious social unrest cannot be gained from merely propagandistic literature rather must we become conversant with the larger phases of human expression manifest in art literature and above all the modern drama the strongest and most far-reaching interpreter of our deep-felt dissatisfaction what a tremendous factor for the awakening of conscious discontent are the simple canvases of a millet the figures of his peasants what terrible indictment against our social wrongs wrongs that condemn the man with the hoe to hopeless drudgery himself excluded from nature's bounty the vision of a meunier conceives the growing solidarity and defiance of labour in the group of miners carrying their maimed brother to safety his genius thus powerfully portrays the interrelation of the seething unrest among those slaving in the bowels of the earth and the spiritual revolt that seeks artistic expression no less important is the factor for rebellious awakening in modern literature turgenev dostoevsky tolstoy andreyev gorky whitman emerson and scores of others embodying the spirit of universal ferment and the longing for social change still more far-reaching is the modern drama as the leaven of radical thought and the disseminator of new values it might seem an exaggeration to ascribe to the modern drama such an important role but a study of the development of modern ideas in most countries will prove that the drama has succeeded in driving home great social truths truths generally ignored when presented in other forms no doubt there are exceptions as russia and france russia with its terrible political pressure has made people think and has awakened their social sympathies because of the tremendous contrast which exists between the intellectual life of the people and the despotic regime that is trying to crush that life yet while the great dramatic works of tolstoy chechov gorky and andreyev closely mirror the life and the struggle the hopes and aspirations of the russian people they did not influence radical thought to the extent the drama has done in other countries who can deny however the tremendous influence exerted by the power of darkness or night lodging tolstoy the real true christian is yet the greatest enemy of organized christianity with a master hand he portrays the destructive effects upon the human mind of the power of darkness the superstitions of the christian church what other medium could express with such dramatic force the responsibility of the church for crimes committed by its deluded victims what other medium could in consequence rouse the indignation of man's conscience similarly direct and powerful is the indictment contained in gorky's night lodging the social pariahs forced into poverty and crime yet desperately clutch at the last vestiges of hope and aspiration lost existences these blighted and crushed by cruel unsocial environment france on the other hand with her continuous struggle for liberty is indeed the cradle of radical thought as such she too did not need the drama as a means of awakening and yet the works of brieux as robe rouge portraying the terrible corruption of the judiciary and mirbeau's les affaires sont les affaires picturing the destructive influence of wealth on the human soul have undoubtedly reached wider circles than most of the articles and books which have been written in france on the social question in countries like germany scandinavia england and even in america though in a lesser degree the drama is the vehicle which is really making history disseminating radical thought in ranks not otherwise to be reached 
Let us take Germany, for instance. For nearly a quarter of a century, men of brains, of ideas, and of the greatest integrity, made it their life work to spread the truth of human brotherhood, of justice, among the oppressed and downtrodden. Socialism, that tremendous revolutionary wave, was to the victims of a merciless and inhumane system like water to the parched lips of the desert traveller. Alas, the cultured people remained absolutely indifferent. To them that revolutionary tide was but the murmur of dissatisfied, discontented men, dangerous, illiterate troublemakers, whose proper place was behind prison bars. Self-satisfied as the cultured usually are, they could not understand why one should fuss about the fact that thousands of people were starving, though they contributed towards the wealth of the world. Surrounded by beauty and luxury, they could not believe that side by side with them lived human beings degraded to a position lower than a beast's, shelterless and ragged, without hope or ambition. This condition of affairs was particularly pronounced in Germany after the Franco-German War, Full to the bursting point with its victory, German thrived on a sentimental patriotic literature, thereby poisoning the minds of the country's youth by the glory of conquest and bloodshed. Intellectual Germany had to take refuge in the literature of other countries, in the works of Ibsen, Zola, Daudet, Maupassant, and especially in the great works of Dostoevsky, Tolstoy, and Turgenev. But as no country can long maintain a standard of culture without a literature and drama related to its own soil, so Germany gradually began to develop a drama reflecting the life and the struggles of its own people. Arno Holtz, one of the youngest dramatists of that period, startled the Philistines out of their ease and comfort with his Familie Zelike. The play deals with society's refuse, men and women of the alleys, whose only subsistence consists of what they can pick out of the garbage barrels. A gruesome subject, is it not? And yet, what other method is there to break through the hard shell of the minds and souls of people who have never known want, and who therefore assume that all is well in the world? Needless to say, the play aroused tremendous indignation. The truth is bitter, and the people living on the Fifth Avenue of Berlin hated to be confronted with the truth. Not that the Familia Zelica represented anything that had not been written about for years without any seeming result, but the dramatic genius of Holtz, together with the powerful interpretation of the play, necessarily made inroads into the widest circles, and forced people to think about the terrible inequalities around them. Zudermann's Ehre and Heimat dealt with vital subjects, I have already referred to the sentimental patriotism so completely turning the head of the average German as to create a perverted conception of honour. Dueling became an everyday affair, costing innumerable lives. A great cry was raised against the fad by a number of leading writers, but nothing acted as such a clarifier and exposer of that national disease as the Ehre. Not that the play merely deals with dueling. It analyses the real meaning of honour, proving that it is not a fixed, inborn feeling, but that it varies with every people and every epoch, depending particularly on one's economic and social station in life. We realise from this play that the man in the brownstone mansion will necessarily define honour differently from his victims. The family Heinecke enjoys the charity of the millionaire Mühling, being permitted to occupy a dilapidated shanty on his premises in the absence of their son, Robert. The latter, as Mooling's representative, is making a vast fortune for his employer in India. On his return, Robert discovers that his sister had been seduced by young Mooling, whose father graciously offers to straighten matters with a cheque for 40,000 marks. Robert, outraged and indignant, resents the insult to his family's honour, and is forthwith dismissed from his position for impudence. Robert finally throws this accusation into the face of the philanthropist millionaire. We slave for you, we sacrifice our heart's blood for you, while you seduce our daughters and sisters and kindly pay for their disgrace with the gold we have earned for you. That is what you call honour. An incidental sidelight upon the conception of honour is given by Count Trast, the principal character in the era. 
a man widely conversant with the customs of various climes, who relates that in his many travels he chanced across a savage tribe whose honour he mortally offended by refusing the hospitality which offered him the charms of the chieftain's wife. The theme of Heimat treats of the struggle between the old and the young generations. It holds a permanent and important place in dramatic literature. Magda, the daughter of Lieutenant Colonel Schwartz, has committed an unpardonable sin. She refused the suitor selected by her father. For daring to disobey the parental commands, she is driven from home. Magda, full of life and the spirit of liberty, goes out into the world, to return to her native town twelve years later, a celebrated singer. She consents to visit her parents on condition that they respect the privacy of her past. But her martinet father immediately begins to question her, insisting on his paternal rights. Magda is indignant, but gradually his persistence brings to light the tragedy of her life. He learns that the respected counsellor von Keller had in his student days been Magda's lover, while she was battling for her economic and social independence. The consequence of the fleeting romance was a child, deserted by the man even before birth. The rigid military father of Magda demands as retribution from Councillor von Kehler that he legalise the love affair. In view of Magda's social and professional success, Kehler willingly consents, but on condition that she forsake the stage and place the child in an institution. The struggle between the old and the new culminates in Magda's defiant words, of the woman grown to conscious independence of thought and action. I'll say what I think of you, of you and your respectable society. Why should I be worse than you that I must prolong my existence among you by a lie? Why should this gold upon my body and the lustre which surrounds my name only increase my infamy? Have I not worked early and late for ten long years? Have I not woven this dress with sleepless nights? Have I not built up my career step by step? like thousands of my kind. Why should I blush before anyone? I am myself, and through myself I have become what I am. The general theme of Heimat was not original. It had been previously treated by a master hand in Fathers and Sons, partly because Turgenev's great work was typical rather of Russian than universal conditions, and still more because it was in the form of fiction, the influence of fathers and sons was limited to Russia, but Heimat, especially because of its dramatic expression, became almost a world factor. The dramatist, who not only disseminated radicalism, but literally revolutionized the thoughtful Germans, is, is Gerhard Hauptmann. His first play, For Sonnenaufgang, refused by every leading German theatre, and first performed in a wretched little playhouse behind a beer garden, acted like a stroke of lightning, illuminating the entire social horizon. Its subject matter deals with the life of an extensive landowner, ignorant, illiterate, and brutalized, and his economic slaves of the same mental calibre. The influence of wealth both on the victims who created it and the possessor thereof is shown in the most vivid colours, as resulting in drunkenness, idiocy, and decay. But the most striking feature of Fort Sonnenaufgang, the one which brought a shower of abuse on Hauptmann's head, was the question as to the indiscriminate breeding of children by unfit parents. During the second performance of the play, a leading Berlin surgeon almost caused a panic in the theatre by swinging a pair of forceps over his head and screaming at the top of his voice, The decency and morality of Germany are at stake if childbirth is to be discussed openly from the stage. The surgeon is forgotten, and Hauptmann stands a colossal figure before the world. When Die Weber first saw the light, pandemonium broke out in the land of thinkers and poets. What? cried the moralists. Working men, dirty, filthy slaves, to be put on the stage? Poverty, in all its horrors and ugliness, to be dished out as an after-dinner amusement? That is too much! Indeed, it was too much for the fat and greasy bourgeoisie to be brought face to face with the horrors of the weaver's existence. It was too much because of the truth and reality that rang like thunder in the deaf ears of self-satisfied society, jacuzzi. Of course, it was generally known even before the appearance of this drama 
that capital cannot get fat unless it devours labour that wealth cannot be hoarded except through the channels of poverty hunger and cold but such things are better kept in the dark lest the victims awaken to a realization of their position but it is the purpose of the modern drama to rouse the consciousness of the oppressed and that indeed was the purpose of gerhard hauptmann in depicting to the world the conditions of the weavers in silesia human beings working eighteen hours daily yet not earning enough for bread and fuel human beings living in broken wretched huts half covered with snow and nothing but tatters to protect them from the cold infants covered with scurvy from hunger and exposure pregnant women in the last stages of consumption victims of a benevolent christian era without life without hope without warmth ah yes it was too much hauptmann's dramatic versatility deals with every stratum of social life besides portraying the grinding effect of economic conditions he also treats of the struggle of the individual for his mental and spiritual liberation from the slavery of convention and tradition thus heinrich the bell forger in the dramatic prose poem die versunken glucher fails to reach the mountain peaks of liberty because as rautendulen said he had lived in the valley too long similarly dr vokerath and anna mar remain lonely souls because they too lack the strength to defy venerated traditions yet their very failure must awaken the rebellious spirit against a world forever hindering individual and social emancipation max halber's jugend and wedekin frühling's erwachen are dramas which have disseminated radical thought in an altogether different direction they treat of the child and the dense ignorance and narrow puritanism that meet the awakening of nature particularly this is true of frühling's erwachen young boys and girls sacrificed on the altar of false education and of our sickening morality that prohibits the enlightenment of youth as to questions so imperative to the health and well-being of society the origin of life and its functions it shows how a mother and a truly good mother at that keeps her fourteen-year-old daughter in absolute ignorance as to all matters of sex and when finally the young girl falls a victim to her own ignorance the same mother sees her daughter killed by quack medicines the inscription on her grave states that she died of anaemia and morality is satisfied the fatality of our puritanic hypocrisy in these matters is especially illumined by vedekind in so far as our most promising children fall victims to sex ignorance and the utter lack of appreciation on the part of the teachers of the child's awakening wendler unusually developed and alert for her age pleads with her mother to explain the mystery of life i have a sister who has been married for two and a half years i myself have been made an aunt for the third time and i haven't the least idea how it all comes about don't be cross mother dear whom in the world should i ask but you don't scold me for asking about it give me an answer how does it happen you cannot really deceive yourself that i who am fourteen years old still believe in the stork were her mother herself not a victim of false notions of morality an affectionate and sensible explanation might have saved her daughter but the conventional mother seeks to hide her moral shame and embarrassment in this evasive reply in order to have a child one must love the man to whom one is married one must love him wendler as you at your age are still unable to love now you know it how much wendler knew the mother realized too late the pregnant girl imagines herself ill with dropsy and when her mother cries in desperation you haven't the dropsy you have a child girl the agonized wendler exclaims in bewilderment but it's not possible mother i'm not married yet oh mother why didn't you tell me everything with equal stupidity the boy morris is driven to suicide because he fails in his school examinations and Melchior, the youthful father of Wendler's unborn child, is sent to the house of correction, his early sexual awakening stamping him a degenerate in the eyes of teachers and parents. For years thoughtful men and women in Germany had advocated the compelling necessity of sex enlightenment. 
Mutterschutz, a publication specially devoted to frank and intelligent discussion of the sex problem, has been carrying on its agitation for a considerable time, but it remained for the dramatic genius of Wedekind to influence radical thought to the extent of forcing the introduction of sex physiology in many schools of Germany. Scandinavia, like Germany, was advanced through the drama much more than through any other channel. Long before Ibsen appeared on the scene, Bjornsson, the great essayist, thundered against the inequalities and injustice prevalent in those countries, but his was a voice in the wilderness, reaching but the few. Not so with Ibsen. His brand, doll's house, pillars of society, ghosts, and an enemy of the people have considerably undermined the old conceptions, and replaced them by a modern and real view of life. One has but to read Brand to realise the modern conception, let us say, of religion. Religion as an ideal to be achieved on earth. Religion as a principle of human brotherhood, of solidarity and kindness. Ibsen, the supreme hater of all social shams, has torn the veil of hypocrisy from their faces. His greatest onslaught, however, is on the four cardinal points supporting the flimsy network of society. First, the lie upon which rests the life of today. Second, the futility of sacrifice, as preached by our moral codes. Third, petty material consideration, which is the only god the majority worships. And fourth, the deadening influence of provincialism. These four recur as the leitmotif in Ibsen's plays, but particularly in Pillars of Society, Doll's House, Ghosts, and An Enemy of the People. Pillars of Society. What a tremendous indictment against the social structure that rests on rotten and decayed pillars. Pillars nicely gilded and apparently intact, yet merely hiding their true condition. And what are these pillars? Consul Bernick. At the very height of his social and financial career, the benefactor of his town and the strongest pillar of the community has reached the summit through the channel of lies, deception and fraud. He has robbed his bosom friend, Johann, of his good name, and has betrayed Lona Hessel, the woman he loved, to marry her stepsister for the sake of her money. He has enriched himself by shady transactions under cover of the community's good and finally even goes to the extent of endangering human life by preparing the Indian girl, a rotten and dangerous vessel, to go to sea. But the return of Lona brings him the realisation of the emptiness and meanness of his narrow life. He seeks to placate the waking consciousness by the hope that he has cleared the ground for the better life of his son, of the new generation. But even this last hope soon falls to the ground, as he realises that truth cannot be built on a lie. At the very moment when the whole town is prepared to celebrate the great benefactor of the community with banquet praise, he himself, now grown to full spiritual manhood, confesses to the assembled townspeople, I have no right to this homage. My fellow citizens must know me to the core. Then let everyone examine himself, and let us realise the prediction that from this event we begin a new time, the old, with its tinsel, its hypocrisy, its hollowness, its lying propriety and its pitiful cowardice, shall lie behind us like a museum, open for instruction. With a doll's house, Ibsen has paved the way for woman's emancipation. Nora awakens from her doll's role to the realisation of the injustice done her by her father and her husband, Helmer Torvald. While I was at home with father, he used to tell me all his opinions, and I held the same opinions. If I had others, I concealed them, because he would not have approved. He used to call me his doll child, and play with me as I played with my dolls. Then I came to live in your house. You settled everything according to your taste, and I got the same taste as you, or I pretended to. When I look back on it now, I seem to have been living like a beggar, from hand to mouth. I lived by performing tricks for you, Torvald. You and father have done me a great wrong. In vain, Helmer uses the old Philistine arguments, wifely duty and social obligations. Nora has grown out of her doll's dress into full stature of conscious womanhood. She is determined to think and judge for herself. She has realised that before all else she is a human being, owing the first duty to herself. She is undaunted even by the possibility of social ostracism. 
she has become sceptical of the justice of the law, the wisdom of the constituted. Her rebelling soul rises in protest against the existing. In her own words, I must make up my mind which is right, society or I. In her childlike faith in her husband, she had hoped for the great miracle, but it was not the disappointed hope that opened her vision to the falsehoods of marriage. It was rather the smug contentment of Helmer with a safe lie, one that would remain hidden and not endanger his social standing. When Nora closed behind her the door of her gilded cage, and went out into the world, a new, regenerated personality, she opened the gate of freedom and truth for her own sex and the race to come. More than any other play, Ghosts has acted like a bomb explosion, shaking the social structure to its very foundations. In Doll's House, the justification of the union between Nora and Helmer rested at least on the husband's conception of integrity and rigid adherence to our social morality. Indeed, he was the conventional, ideal husband and devoted father. Not so in Ghosts. Mrs. Alving married Captain Alving, only to find that he was a physical and mental wreck, and that life with him would mean utter degradation and be fatal to possible offspring. In her despair she turned to her youth's companion, young Pastor Manders, who, as the true saviour of souls for heaven, must needs be indifferent to earthly necessities. He sent her back to shame and degradation, to her duties to husband and home. Indeed, happiness, to him, was but the unholy manifestation of a rebellious spirit, and a wife's duty was not to judge, but to bear with humility the cross which a higher power had for your own good laid upon you. Mrs. Alving bore the cross for twenty-six long years, not for the sake of the higher power, but for her little son Oswald, whom she longed to save from the poisonous atmosphere of her husband's home. It was also for the sake of the beloved son that she supported the lie of his father's goodness, in superstitious awe of duty and decency. She learned, alas, too late, that the sacrifice of her entire life had been in vain, and that her son Oswald was visited by the sins of his father, that he was irrevocably doomed. This too she learned, that we are all of us ghosts, it is not only what we have learned, what we have inherited from our father and the mother that walks in us. It is all sorts of dead ideas and lifeless old beliefs. They have no vitality, but they cling to us all the same, and we can't get rid of them. And then we are one and all so pitifully afraid of light. When you forced me under the yoke you called duty and obligation, when you praised as right and proper what my whole soul rebelled against as something loathsome, it was then that I began to look into the seams of your doctrine, I only wished to pick at a single knot, but when I had got that undone, the whole thing ravelled out, and then I understood that it was all machine-sown. How could a society machine-sown fathom the seething depths whence issued the great masterpiece of Heinrich Ibsen? It could not understand, and therefore it poured the vials of abuse and venom upon its greatest benefactor. That Ibsen was not daunted, he has proved by his reply in An Enemy of the People. In that great drama, Ibsen performs the last funeral rites over a decaying and dying social system. Out of its ashes rises the regenerated individual, the bold and daring rebel. Dr. Stockman, an idealist, full of social sympathy and solidarity, is called to his native town as the physician of the baths. He soon discovers that the latter are built on a swamp, and that instead of finding relief, the patients who flock to the place are being poisoned. An honest man of strong convictions, the doctor considers it his duty to make his discovery known. But he soon learns that dividends and profits are concerned neither with health nor principles. Even the reformers of the town, represented in The People's Messenger, always ready to prate of their devotion to the people, withdraw their support from the reckless idealist, the moment they learn that the doctor's discovery may bring the town into disrepute and thus injure their pockets. But Dr. Stockman continues in the faith he entertains for his townsmen. They would hear him, but here too he soon finds himself alone. He cannot even secure a place to proclaim his great truth, 
and when he finally succeeds, he is overwhelmed by abuse and ridicule as the enemy of the people. The doctor, so enthusiastic of his town people's assistance to eradicate the evil, is soon driven to a solitary position. The announcement of his discovery would result in a pecuniary loss to the town, and that consideration induces the officials, the good citizens, and soul reformers to stifle the voice of truth. He finds them all a compact majority, unscrupulous enough to be willing to build up the prosperity of the town on a quagmire of lies and fraud. He is accused of trying to ruin the community, but to his mind, it does not matter if a lying community is ruined, it must be levelled to the ground. All men who live upon lies must be exterminated like vermin. You'll bring it to such a pass that the whole country will deserve to perish. Dr. Stockman is not a practical politician. A free man, he thinks, must not behave like a blackguard. He must not so act that he would spit in his own face, for only cowards permit considerations of pretended general welfare or of party to override truth and ideals. Party programmes wring the necks of all young living truths, and considerations of expediency turn morality and righteousness upside down, until life is simply hideous. These plays of Ibsen, The Pillars of Society, A Doll's House, Ghosts, and An Enemy of the People, constitute a dynamic force which is gradually dissipating the ghosts walking the social burying ground called civilization. Nay, more, Ibsen's destructive effects are at the same time supremely constructive, for he not merely undermines existing pillars, indeed he builds with sure strokes the foundation of a healthier, ideal future, based on the sovereignty of the individual within a sympathetic social environment. England, with her great pioneers of radical thought, the intellectual pilgrims like Godwin, Robert Owen, Darwin, Spencer, William Morris, and scores of others, with her wonderful larks of liberty, Shelley, Byron, Keats, is another example of the influence of dramatic art. Within comparatively a few years, the dramatic works of Shaw, Pinero, Galsworthy, Ran Kennedy, have carried radical thought to the ears formerly deaf, even to Great Britain's wondrous poets. Thus, a public which will remain indifferent, reading an essay by Robert Owen on poverty, or ignore Bernard Shaw's socialistic tracts, was made to think by Major Barbara, wherein poverty is described as the greatest crime of Christian civilization. Poverty makes people weak, slavish, puny. Poverty creates disease, crime, prostitution. In fine, poverty is responsible for all the ills and evils of the world. Poverty also necessitates dependency, charitable organizations, institutions that thrive off the very thing they are trying to destroy. The Salvation Army, for instance, as shown in Major Barbara, fights drunkenness, yet one of its greatest contributors is Badger, a whiskey distiller, who furnishes yearly thousands of pounds to do away with the very source of his wealth. Bernard Shaw, therefore, concludes that the only real benefactor of society is a man like Undershaft, Barbara's father, a cannon manufacturer, whose theory of life is that powder is stronger than words. The worst of crimes, says Undershaft, is poverty. All the other crimes are virtues beside it. All the other crimes are virtues beside it. All the other dishonours are chivalry itself by comparison. Poverty blights whole cities, spreads horrible pestilences, strikes dead the very soul of all who come within sight, sound, or smell of it. What you call crime is nothing. A murder here, a theft there, a blow now and a curse there. What do they matter? They are only the accidents and illnesses of life. There are not fifty genuine professional criminals in London, but there are millions of poor people, abject people, dirty people, ill-fed, ill-clothed people. They poison us morally and physically. They kill the happiness of society. They force us to do away with our own liberties and to organize unnatural cruelties for fear they should rise against us and drag us down into their abyss. Poverty and slavery have stood up for centuries to your sermons and leading articles. They will not stand up to my machine guns. Don't preach at them. Don't reason with them. Kill them. It is a final test of conviction, the only lever strong enough to overturn a social system. Vote. Bah! When you vote, you only change the name of the cabinet. When you shoot, 
you pull down governments, inaugurate new epochs, abolish old orders, and set up new. No wonder people cared little to read Mr. Shaw's socialistic tracts. In no other way but in the drama could he deliver such forcible historic truths, and therefore it is only through the drama that Mr. Shaw is a revolutionary factor in the dissemination of radical ideas. After Hauptmann die Weber, Strife by Galsworthy is the most important labour drama. The theme of Strife is a strike with two dominant factors, Antony, the president of the company, rigid, uncompromising, unwilling to make the slightest concession, although the men held out for months and are in a condition of semi-starvation, and David Roberts, an uncompromising revolutionist, whose devotion to the working man and the cause of freedom is at white heat. Between them the strikers are worn and weary with the terrible struggle, and are harassed and driven by the awful sight of poverty and want in their families. The most marvellous and brilliant piece of work in strife is Galsworthy's portrayal of the mob, its fickleness and lack of backbone. One moment they applaud old Thomas, who speaks of the power of God and religion and admonishes the men against rebellion. The next instant they are carried away by a walking delegate who pleads the cause of the Union, the Union that always stands for compromise, and which forsakes the working man whenever they dare to strike for independent demands. Again, they are aglow with the earnestness, the spirit, and the intensity of David Roberts, all these people willing to go in whatever direction the wind blows. It is the curse of the working class that they always follow like sheep led to slaughter. Consistency is the greatest crime of our commercial age. No matter how intense the spirit or how important the man, the moment he will not allow himself to be used or sell his principles, he is thrown on the dust heap. Such was the fate of the president of the company, Antony, and of David Roberts. To be sure, they represented opposite poles, poles antagonistic to each other, poles divided by a terrible gap that can never be bridged over, yet they shared a common fate. Antony is the embodiment of conservatism, of old ideas, of iron methods. I have been chairman of this company thirty-two years. I have fought the men four times. I have never been defeated. It has been said that times have changed. If they have, I have not changed with them. It has been said that masters and men are equal. Can't. There can be only one master in a house. It has been said that capital and labour have the same interests. Can't. Their interests are as wide asunder as the poles. There is only one way of treating men, with the iron rod. Masters are masters, men are men. We may not like this adherence to old, reactionary notions, and yet there is something admirable in the courage and consistency of this man. Nor is he half as dangerous to the interests of the oppressed as our sentimental and soft reformers who rob with nine fingers and give liberties with the tenth who grind human beings like Russell Sage, and then spend millions of dollars in social research work, who turn beautiful young plants into faded old women, and then give them a few paltry dollars, or found a home for working girls. Antony is a worthy foe, and to fight such a foe one must learn to meet him in open battle. David Roberts has all the mental and moral attributes of his adversary, coupled with the spirit of revolt, and the depth of modern ideas, he too is consistent, and wants nothing for his class short of complete victory. It is not for this little moment of time we are fighting, not for our own little bodies and their warmth, it is for all those who come after, for all times. Oh, men, for the love of them, don't turn up another stone on their heads. Don't help to blacken the sky. If we can shake that white-faced monster with the bloody lips, that has sucked the lives out of ourselves, our wives, and our children since the world began, if we have not the hearts of men to stand against it, breast to breast and eye to eye, and force it backwards till it cry for mercy, it will go on, sucking life, and we shall stay for ever where we are, less than the very dogs. It is inevitable that compromise and petty interest should pass on and leave two such giants behind, Inevitable, until the mass will reach the stature of a David Roberts. Will it ever? Prophecy is not the vocation of the dramatist, yet the moral lesson is evident. 
one cannot help realising that the working men will have to use methods hitherto unfamiliar to them, that they will have to discard all those elements in their midst that are forever ready to reconcile the irreconcilable, namely capital and labour. They will have to learn that characters like David Roberts are the very forces that have revolutionised the world, and thus paved the way for emancipation out of the clutches of that white-faced monster with bloody lips, towards a brighter horizon, a freer life, and a deeper recognition of human values. End of section 1 of chapter 12《Chapter Twelve of Anarchism and Other Essays》This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Peter Yearsley.《Anarchism and Other Essays by Emma Goldman》Section Two of Chapter Twelve: The Modern Drama. No subject of equal social import has received such extensive consideration within the last few years as the question of prison and punishment. Hardly any magazine of consequence that has not devoted its columns to the discussion of this vital theme. A number of books by able writers, both in America and abroad, have discussed this topic from the historic, psychologic and social standpoint, all agreeing that present penal institutions and our mode of coping with crime have in every respect proved inadequate as well as wasteful. One would expect that something very radical should result from the cumulative literary indictment of the social crimes perpetrated upon the prisoner. Yet, with the exception of a few minor and comparatively insignificant reforms in some of our prisons, absolutely nothing has been accomplished. But at last this grave social wrong has found dramatic interpretation in Galworthy's Justice. The play opens in the office of James Howe and Sons, Solicitors. The senior clerk, Robert Cokeson, discovers that a cheque he had issued for nine pounds has been forged to ninety. By elimination, suspicion falls upon William Falder, the junior office clerk. The latter is in love with a married woman, the abused, ill-treated wife of a brutal drunkard. Pressed by his employer, a severe yet not unkindly man, Falder confesses the forgery, pleading the dire necessity of his sweetheart, Ruth Honeywill with whom he had planned to escape to save her from the unbearable brutality of her husband. Notwithstanding the entreaties of young Walter, who is touched by modern ideas, his father, a moral and law-respecting citizen, turns Felder over to the police. The second act in the courtroom shows justice in the very process of manufacture. The scene equals in dramatic power and psychologic verity the great court scene in Resurrection. Young Falder, a nervous and rather weakly youth of twenty-three, stands before the bar. Ruth, his married sweetheart, full of love and devotion, burns with anxiety to save the young man whose affection brought about his present predicament. The young man is defended by lawyer Frome, whose speech to the jury is a masterpiece of deep social philosophy, wreathed with the tendrils of human understanding and sympathy. He does not attempt to dispute the mere fact of Falder having altered the cheque, and though he pleads temporary aberration in defence of his client, that plea is based upon a social consciousness as deep and all-embracing as the roots of our social ills. The background of life, that palpitating life which always lies behind the commission of a crime. He shows Falder to have faced the alternative of seeing the beloved woman murdered by her brutal husband, whom she cannot divorce, or of taking the law into his own hands. The defence pleads with the jury not to turn the weak young man into a criminal by condemning him to prison, for justice is a machine that, when someone has given it a starting push, rolls on of itself. Is this young man to be ground to pieces under this machine for an act which, at the worst, was one of weakness? Is he to become a member of the luckless crews that man those dark, ill-starred ships called prisons? I urge you, gentlemen, do not ruin this young man, for as a result of those four minutes, ruin, utter and irretrievable, stares him in the face. The rolling of the chariot wheels of justice over this boy began when it was decided to prosecute him.
but the chariot of justice rolls mercilessly on for as the learned judge says the law is what it is a majestic edifice sheltering all of us each stone of which rests on another folder is sentenced to three years penal servitude in prison the young inexperienced convict soon finds himself the victim of the terrible system the authorities admit that young folder is mentally and physically in bad shape but nothing can be done in the matter many others are in a similar position and the quarters are inadequate the third scene of the third act is heart-gripping in its silent force the whole scene is a pantomime taking place in folder's prison cell in fast-falling daylight folder in his stockings is seen standing motionless with his head inclined towards the door listening he moves a little closer to the door his stockinged feet making no noise he stops at the door he is trying harder and harder to hear something any little thing that is going on outside he springs suddenly upright as if at a sound and remains perfectly motionless then with a heavy sigh he moves to his work and stands looking at it with his head down he does a stitch or two having the air of a man so lost in sadness that each stitch is as it were a coming to life then turning abruptly he begins pacing his cell moving his head like an animal pacing its cage he stops again at the door listens and putting the palms of his hands against it with his fingers spread out leans his forehead against the iron turning from it presently he moves slowly back towards the window holding his head as if he felt that it were going to burst and stops under the window but since he cannot see out of it he leaves off looking and picking up the lid of one of the tins peers into it as if trying to make a companion of his own face it has grown very nearly dark suddenly the lid falls out of his hand with a clatter the only sound that has broken the silence and he stands staring intently at the wall where the stuff of the shirt is hanging rather white in the darkness he seems to be seeing somebody or something there there is a sharp tap and click the cell light behind the glass screen has been turned up the cell is brightly lighted folder is seen gasping for breath a sound from far away as of distant dull beating on thick metal is suddenly audible folder shrinks back not able to bear this sudden clamour but the sound grows as though some great tumbril were rolling towards the cell and gradually it seems to hypnotize him he begins creeping inch by inch nearer to the door the banging sound travelling from cell to cell draws closer and closer Fowler's hands are seen moving as if his spirit had already joined in this beating and the sound swells till it seems to have entered the very cell he suddenly raises his clenched fists panting violently he flings himself at his door and beats on it finally felder leaves the prison a broken ticket of leave man the stamp of the convict upon his brow the iron of misery in his soul thanks to ruth's pleading the firm of james howe and son is willing to take felder back in their employ on condition that he give up ruth it is then that Falder learns the awful news that the woman he loves had been driven by the merciless economic Moloch to sell herself. She tried making skirts, cheap things. I never made more than ten shillings a week, buying my own cotton and working all day. I hardly ever got to bed till past twelve. And then my employer happened. He's happened ever since. At this terrible psychologic moment the police appear to drag him back to prison for failing to report himself as ticket of leave man completely overwhelmed by the inexorability of his environment young falder seeks and finds peace greater than human justice by throwing himself down to death as the detectives are taking him back to prison it would be impossible to estimate the effect produced by this play perhaps some conception can be gained from the very unusual circumstance that it had proved so powerful as to induce the home secretary of great britain to undertake extensive prison reforms in england a very encouraging sign this of the influence exerted by the modern drama it is to be hoped that the thundering indictment of mr goldsworthy will not remain without similar effect upon the public sentiment and prison conditions of america 
at any rate it is certain that no other modern play has borne such direct and immediate fruit in wakening the social conscience another modern play the servant in the house strikes a vital key in our social life the hero of mr kennedy's masterpiece is robert a coarse filthy drunkard whom respectable society has repudiated robert the sewer cleaner is the real hero of the play nay its true and only saviour it is he who volunteers to go down into the dangerous sewer so that his comrades can have light and air after all has he not sacrificed his life always so that others may have light and air the thought that labour is the redeemer of social well-being has been cried from the housetops in every tongue and every clime yet the simple words of robert express the significance of labour and its mission with far greater potency america is still in its dramatic infancy most of the attempts along this line to mirror life have been wretched failures still there are hopeful signs in the attitude of the intelligent public towards modern plays even if they be from foreign soil the only real drama america has so far produced is the easiest way by eugene walter it is supposed to represent a peculiar phase of new york life if that were all it would be of minor significance that which gives the play its real importance and value lies much deeper it lies first in the fundamental current of our social fabric which drives us all even stronger characters than laura into the easiest way a way so very destructive of integrity truth and justice secondly the cruel senseless fatalism conditioned in laura's sex these two features put the universal stamp upon the play and characterize it as one of the strongest dramatic indictments against society the criminal waste of human energy in economic and social conditions drives laura as it drives the average girl to marry any man for a home or as it drives men to endure the worst indignities for a miserable pittance then there is that other respectable institution the fatalism of laura's sex the inevitability of that force is summed up in the following words don't you know that we count no more in the life of these men than tamed animals it's a game and if we don't play our cards well we lose woman in the battle with life has but one weapon one commodity sex that alone serves as a trump card in the game of life this blind fatalism has made of woman a parasite an inert thing why then expect perseverance or energy of laura the easiest way is the path mapped out for her from time immemorial she could follow no other a number of other plays could be quoted as characteristic of the growing role of the drama as a disseminator of radical thought suffice to mention the third degree by charles klein the fourth estate by medill patterson a man's world by ida crouchers all pointing to the dawn of dramatic art in america an art which is discovering to the people the terrible diseases of our social body it has been said of old all roads lead to rome in paraphrased application to the tendencies of our day it may truly be said that all roads lead to the great social reconstruction the economic awakening of the working man and his realization of the necessity for concerted industrial action the tendencies of modern education especially in their application to the free development of the child the spirit of growing unrest expressed through and cultivated by art and literature all pave the way to the open road above all the modern drama operating through the double channel of dramatist and interpreter affecting as it does both mind and heart is the strongest force in developing social discontent swelling the powerful tide of unrest that sweeps onward and over the dam of ignorance prejudice and superstition the end of chapter twelve section two recorded by peter yearsley and the end of anarchism and other essays by emma goldman